um, I'm going to introduce our last teller for the night, Margaret Carter. Uh, Margaret has a story about changing the entire state of Oregon as just one of its citizens. Yeah, floor, Margaret. Hi, my name is Margaret Carter. Thanks so much to all of you for sharing this evening and being a part of it with me. I have served in many roles in my life from that of a mother, a choir director, educator, to serving in the Oregon legislature. Two things that have been constant with me and near to my heart today throughout my journey was perseverance and a desire to live with purpose. You see, I left an abusive marriage in November of 1967, two days after getting out of the hospital with a broken jawbone. Along with my small children in tow, we boarded a train in Shreveport, Louisiana, and headed to Portland, Oregon. All because of a dream. That is where I started a new life. This is where I started a new life for myself and my children, thank God for that. I arrived here only having $100 in my pocket. My departure started a migration of my southern roots with 90 family members within four years moving to the Pacific Northwest. There were times I have to tell you, and I really did not know how I was going to make it. I worked odd jobs, went back to school, and finished my BA degree in education. Portland provided opportunity for me that I never had because I was able to go on and secure my master's degree at well. My higher education all began at Grambling State University, where I received a scholarship from the Louisiana Education Association. As salutatorian of my class, that was the highest honor that I thought anyone could get, not expecting it to have it, not being able to, for my parents to send me to college because my father was a minister and he didn't make a lot of money doing that in those days. But completing my degree was my highest goal because so many people believed in me and my abilities to be a part of this new leadership of young people who were involved in Shreveport to lead our community to better opportunities. I dropped out of college and got married. But I knew, I knew from my time of growing up in the South that having an education was the only way, my only way out of poverty. I wanted my children to have better access and opportunities in higher education than I have. So I had this dream, it was more or less like a vision, where I was in this faraway place where a lot of beautiful red roses and green landscape was about. Inez Davis family, my extended family, moved in early years to Portland and they provided me a place to stay. Yes, indeed, all six of us were welcomed. They helped to take good care of us. Even until this day, we are very close. I am grateful to this day for their support, for keeping the children while I work, attend school was one of the most unselfish acts I thought a person could have ever experienced. I worked ridiculously hard to stabilize my family while showing my appreciation to my extended family for the sacrifice that they had made for us. I worked odd jobs until I got into the public school system as a teacher assistant. We moved into our house with nothing but beds for everyone and a dining room table, but thank God it was ours. I was able to apply for state services and receive food stamps to help with the grocery bills because my job only allowed me enough money to pay the household bills. By some magic opportunity, the Seroptimus Club of Portland, Oregon, along with some other white female organizations, heard about my plight and helped out with my schooling. But then I began to get paid requests to speak about my life's journey and received more financial support 
through speaking engagements. I made it through with lots of encouragement, enthusiasm, and an abundance of energy, and yes, prayers even more. My children were still in good hands because my niece moved from Louisiana with me to care for the kids. Diane was great to my kids and took great care of them. It is now in 1983. I'm working on the counseling faculty at Portland Community College. I was asked by a group of lobbyists to consider running for the Oregon legislature. I thought it was a joke. I thought somebody had just made the wrong phone call. Me, a black woman in a predominantly white city running for office? That was hard for me to believe. I didn't believe I had a chance. But I felt this little bitty thought in my head that said this was a time to go to the next level of leadership for accomplishing some of the goals I had around building strong families in our state. We were poor, but we were a strong family. Having greater access to better educational opportunities excited me. Being at the table to discuss budgets for jobs and apprenticeship program for the broader community in Oregon spoke words of wisdom to my heart to run and to run fast. Don't get weary in well-doing. In building stronger community colleges along with providing education to an underclass of people resonated in my heart of hearts. We did it, folk, and I won. I was elected in 1984 as the first African-American woman to the Oregon Legislative Assembly. It was not easy though. I had death threats against me, and a man at a campaign rally for the community got violent with me, pushing me on concrete and telling me to get out of the race and my opponent would make me his secretary. The Democratic Socialists did not think I could represent their interests, so they campaigned against me. My sorority did not support me because another sister's husband was running for the same position, so they became neutral. I felt so alone. I felt out there by myself as the first African-American woman and the only woman that had ever won this district. But I have to tell you, I did not fear because I had a great group of people supporting me and running my campaign. Black and white folks came from across the city together and rallied for me. They saw my ability to persevere no matter the circumstances. They saw I was not afraid. I would knock on any door. Well, as a matter of fact, one night at 12 midnight, I was knocking on this person's door and they came to the door in their pajamas. I had to apologize for still working so late. In my campaign, I campaigned for education, healthcare, and job opportunities. Those issues were very, very important to me. This district needed opportunity because jobs had left the community. It was important to me to help build stronger families for the betterment of our society and our people in our community. Having more people in higher education and a vocational skills training for building greater economic wealth in our community and providing healthcare for children in particular, that message resonated with the voters. After 14 years in the House and 12 years in the Senate, I was incredibly honored to be voted by my caucus to become the president pro tempore of the Senate and later to become the co-chair of the Senate Budget Committee. These positions allowed me to be a part of the greater conversation about the disbursement of state dollars around all the issues that I cared about. This in itself was an accomplished feat a place where my voice could be heard on behalf of my constituents. My goal was to make life easier for people through my words, my deeds, my actions, my promises. Never mind by now, there are nine little kids at home waiting for me to go cook dinner. But this is a part of my purpose in life. And fulfilling my purpose makes me feel like, yes, my mission was hard, but it was accomplished. And with those nine little children, they were never neglected at all.
I went home every day and cooked a four course meal for them. In 1999, I was selected by the Dort Board of Directors of the Urban League of Portland as its CEO, its president CEO. And I served in that position while serving my constituents, helping to keep the Urban League alive financially was my main goal as we entered into the 21st century. There was no way I could say no to my friends and supporters who asked me to serve so that Oregon's African-American premier organization would not die right before our eyes. Many white supporters wrote and called asking me to accept the position. Two foundations promised if I took the position, they would send $25,000 within two weeks of my acceptance and would send staff for corporate community to help get the league back on track. Needless to say, the Urban League is still alive and well today and under great leadership. In 2009, I left the Oregon Senate, accepting an appointment from my very special governor, uh, Governor Kulungoski, to be deputy director of the Department of Human Services alongside my wonderful friend, Dr. Bruce Goldberg. I served at the agency until my retirement from state government in 2014. Today, I am working as an advisor, yes, 85, nearly 85 years of age with two companies on their diversity and inclusion policies. This is a wonderful moment in our history where companies along with government have the great opportunity to capture the moment in time, to take active action for change, to make it right for the sake of human dignity and the history of this great country. Women like me, who are still full of vigor and vitality and are still seeking to contribute to society, are doing this. And I am honored to be among you. Do not allow, however, your age to be the determining factor as to what you do. Don't retire because somebody else thinks you should retire. I wouldn't retire because I don't want the death to come along and hit me on the shoulder and say, come with me because I'm going to be running hard until I still have work to do. No one tells Margaret Carter what I can or cannot do, not even my children who gets worried. I am driven by my love for country and a purpose for living which supersedes anything else that tries to curtail my involvement in our great society. While many of my friends are now retired and having fun traveling across the country and taking cruises, I see myself making a difference with urgency as my fun. I do not want to leave this life without hearing that Margaret Carter made a difference. Thank you. Margaret, thank you so much for closing our show. I'm, it is such a lesson to all of us to see you doing so much work and being such a leader at 84. It, I just cannot thank you enough for being part of our show. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, thanks for watching. If you like this video, check out these other videos from USA Today to stay up to date with all the latest news.